had the privilege of attending our um, Center for Spiritual Living annual convention, which was held, held in Charleston, South Carolina. I attended virtually. I chose not to go uh, to South Carolina this year. Um, I will be sharing with you um, some of the outcome of the general sessions and the speakers and their inspiring talks that challenged us to move through life with compassion and grace. And I will introduce segments of those talks as I work with our tech team uh, during the upcoming weeks. But I assure you that this is one of the better conventions that I remember attending. Uh, it was um, uplifting and inspiring and really represented the inclusivity of our organization, which I am proud to be a part of. And now setting the stage for today, discomfort is the least of our concerns. There are a few quotes that uh, encourage me and support me when I am uh, facing with discomfort and choosing to move forward, whether it's to stay in that and have that pity party. You know, how many of us have those personal pity parties? Okay. And the quicker we move out of them, the more joyful our life becomes, or at least that's been my experience of moving out of my own personal pity party. Um, the first quote is by Kiva Jewel Lingo from her writings, We Were Made for Times, We Were Made for These Times. And she says, when we are clear and sure about what we are doing, we are less open to many possibilities available. But when we let go and let ourselves hang out in the space of not knowing, there is enormous potential and a life could unfold in innumerable ways. Octavia Spencer, an American actress, says this, do not go where the path may lead. Go instead where there is no path and leave a trail. Joseph Campbell, an American writer and professor says this, if you can see the path laid out before you step by step, you know it's not your path. Your own path you make with every step that you take. That's why it is your path. Now, these ideas, ideas seem to be in opposition to our traditional Western mindset and thinking. Uh, and I remember growing up in a corporate environment, or even growing up uh, and being guided in a certain direction. Um, I was always taught you know, that you have a plan you know, in the business sector, you, you create strategic plans. Sometimes we do this here for the center. We create a strategic plan that is a roadmap for where we're going. We can still create those strategic plans and we can have goals, we can have dreams, we can have visions. This is what gives us fuel and motivates us to move forward. But it's the willingness to let go of the specific outcome or attachment to the plan and to forge where there is no plan, creating your own path, creating your own identity, leaving your own footprint and creating a space that works for you and for the entire planetary community. The practices and the tools and the teachings of science of mind invite us to step outside of our comfort zone, to embrace discomfort and to unleash the extraordinary resilient person that we are. This is where our inner work begins. And I have a news flash for you. There is no graduation date from the inner work. There is no graduation date from the inner work. It continues. And so we are to be encouraged to, dis to embrace today's discomfort and watch it make our life grow and achieve fuller and fuller dimensions. February, along with another, with, with a number of different aspects, is also acknowledged as Black History Month. 
and it is intended to acknowledge the highlights of discomfort and challenges, the uncertainty and the coping mechanisms that Black Americans and other people of color in the United States and around the globe have faced and have overcome. And I share with you this morning three brief stories of our unsung heroes in Black American history or in Black history, because two of them are United States and one is Kenya. These individuals made significant contributions but often didn't receive their deserved recognition. And I invite you to look at this from both a historical perspective and also from a current day perspective. In June of 1939, Jane Bolin became the first black woman judge in the United States. She graduated from Yale Law School and served on New York's family court for an impressive four decades. Her work extended beyond legal matters. She advocated against racial bias in probation officer assignments and collaborated with Eleanor Roosevelt on youth crime prevention programs. Our next unsung hero is Alice Allison Dunnigan, a trailblazer. Dunnigan was the first African-American female White House correspondence. She broke barriers by becoming a member of both the Senate and the House of Representatives press galleries. Her passion for writing began at a young age and she eventually covered President Harry S. Truman's campaign. How many knew that? This was new information for me. Her dedication continued as the education consultant for the President's Committee, Committee on Equal Employment Opportunity. And our third hero, Wangiri Mathai, a Kenyan environmentalist, achieved groundbreaking milestones, groundbreaking milestones. She was the first black woman to win the Nobel Peace Prize in 2004 for her environmental work. Additionally, she earned the distinction of being the first woman in East and Central Africa to earn a doctorate. But they founded the, great, the Green Belt Movement, which has planted over 51 million, yes, 51 million trees in Kenya since its inception in 1977. And so these Black history icons that we celebrate and countless others who are living and are now part of the ancestors represent individuals who dare to embrace uncertainty and embark on a transformative journey. I recently watched a webinar hosted by the Washington Post titled, Race in America, Giving Voice to American Fiction. And American Fiction is a movie that is currently showing in the theaters, and I'm going to see it this afternoon, uh, and it will soon be available on uh, Prime, according to the internet. The theme of the movie is that it confronts our cultural obsession with reducing people to outrageous stereotypes. You know, there, there are certain actors and actresses that um, find themselves typecast into a specific type of role. And when we see them, we automatically associate them with that role. And we don't, because they're um, the variety of their experience is not showcased. We, fin we tend to focus on that particular role and pigeonhole them into that. And so this movie is about the stereotypes that um, a certain people are placed in. James Monk, James Wright, excuse me, James Wright, um, who is one of the, the stars in the movie, he plays the role of Monk a frustrated novelist who's fed up with the establishment profiting from black entertainment that relies on tried and offensive tropes. To prove this point, Monk uses his pen, his pen name to write his outlandish black book that propels him to the heart of 
hypocrisy and madness, which he claims to disdain. So sometimes we have to go emerge ourselves into that madness in order to emerge from it and have a different understanding and a greater appreciation of what it is that we disdain and look at how we as individuals or how we as a community can move through that experience. What resonated with me from the webinar was Jeffrey Wright's statement. We don't have the fluency in race, and this does not lead to problem solving. When we fail to acknowledge the history of race, bigotry, ignorance, and other oppressive factors as social constructs, we miss the discomfort resulting from having difficult conversations involving these experiences. And I wanna say this, um, Throughout the civil rights movement, the target and the not no the target is not the right word. The focus that has been portrayed in the press has been the civil rights of African Americans or people of color because of the American experience. However, civil rights and equal opportunity is not bound or defined by the color of one's skin. This is where we need to take that hard look at race as a social construct. It's kind of quiet in here this morning. Recognizing our discomfort is where infinite possibilities generate the potential for personal growth, learning, flexibility, motivation, resilience and adaptability, all of those together. Rather than avoiding discomfort, which I thought I had mastered for a while as a nice camouflage, and then I recognized that's not working for me anymore. <laughs> Rather than avoiding discomfort, we're encouraged to develop effective coping strategies and embrace discomfort as a positive change catalyst. Cognitive dissonance and open-mindedness are aspects of discomfort. And cognitive, cognitive dissonance happens when two or more conflicting thoughts are held in the mind simultaneously, like loving hamburgers and also loving cows. It creates a discomfort when our beliefs are challenged. That's where our discomfort lies, is where our beliefs are challenged and we dig in our heels and resist being challenged. We don't like being challenged. I know I don't like being challenged. And it's also an opportunity to be open to listening and listening for understanding versus listening for preparing a response. Crystal Raypole wrote this on healthline.com. As humans, we generally prefer our world to make sense. Cognitive dissonance can be distressing. That is why we often respond to cognitive dissonance by doing mental gymnastics to feel like the things make sense. Cognitive dissonance can also inspire a change in our behavior and our beliefs. Some effects of cognitive dissonance are anxiety, regret, low self-worth, shame, stress, and anger. Changes can be positive, such as shifting problematic beliefs and harmful habits. We can't let cognitive dissonance hold us back. Instead, we're to see it as an opportunity to broaden our horizons and expand our ex perspectives. Resilience, my new favorite word. Resilience is a vital aspect of human psychology and well being. It is a skill that can be cultivated, empowering each one of us to navigate life's ups and downs with strength and adaptability. Bouncing back from adversity, dealing with discomfort, and adapting and coping effectively with, with challenges are indicators of resilience. 
And Ernest Holmes offers this in 365 Science of Mind. And this is a reading for day 13 in this book. We can overcome the troubles and difficulties that we have allowed to enter our lives when we remember that love is that creating and sustaining presence within us. Love is the creating and sustaining presence within us. God loves, moves us, gives us, and exists in each one of us. And he concludes this by saying, as I eliminate anger and resentment, the divine beauty flows freely through me. As I eliminate anger and resentment, the divine beauty flows freely through me and as me. Our science of mind principles such as affirmations, meditation, spiritual mind treatment, journaling and visually, journaling and visioning help us to develop coping strategies to navigate and manage those stressful or difficult situations in our lives. Embracing uncertainty and adaptability helps us to cope with change. We have always faced change. And what we are facing now is demanding we co-create new ways of being with ourselves, with each other, and in the world. We are preparing for an upcoming presidential election. In case you didn't know, in case you don't follow the bad news or whatever way you tend to describe the news, we're preparing for an upcoming US United States presidential election that has the potentiality to vastly change our USA political landscape. Other examples of change that we are facing that is changing the landscape of our country is states like Florida and others that are passing legislation with the intent of erasing the atrocities of the American slave trade, the impact of sharecropping, the impact of Jim Crow laws, and the ongoing marginalization of segments of our human family. Look at what is happening, the legislation that is happening in our so-called red states to our brothers and sisters in the LGBTQ community. Look at what is happening with our, and I may not be saying this correctly, and I would like for someone to correct me if I'm misstating it. As we look at the people in the trans community that are also being marginalized, murdered, and erased from the landscape of our culture. That's on a global scale. Let's look at this on a local scale within our own families, within our social and civic groups, and even in our spiritual communities, individuals are at opposite ends of the political and social spectrum, creating discomfort and uncertainty. But again, we go to our founder, Ernest Holmes, who gives us this piece of good news. Real unity cannot exclude anything. Real unity cannot exclude anything. And this is from the Holmes Papers, Volume 1, on page 42, if you would like to look up that reference. As spiritual beings, our call is to embrace each other with love, with compassion, and with grace. This was one of the recurring themes throughout the convention this year. And it is the trajectory that our, organ, that our international organization is moving into. Embracing discomfort fosters our intellectual growth, it fuels our curiosity, and it helps us to develop a flexible and open mind that welcomes new possibilities and new ideas. I want to go back to embracing the love and compassion, and especially within our own families or within our communities of influence, recognizing that, uh, in fact, one of the presenters um, offered us the image of an ark. Um, 
At one end of the ark, there are those people who are entrenched in things continuing to be as they are or as they would like for them to be based on their perspective. Moving around the ark, there are people at the other end of the ark that are saying, come on, let's go, it's time for a change. And so we find this resistance at both ends of the ark. Our calling as people of faith, as spiritual communities, is to practice our love and our compassion and to be that catalyst that brings these two seemingly opposite, opposite ends of the ark to a place where we come together in cooperation. Something else that was mentioned in the convention was within our communities, uh, there used to be a guideline that a religious science center could not be within more than 30, I think it was a 30, we had the 30 mile rule. We could not open a new center within 30 miles of an existing rule. Someone said that their vision is that there would be a science of mind church on every single corner. And, and out of that, what emerged is that we are not in competition with each other, even within our own science of mind, religious science, centers of spiritual living communities. We're not in competition with each other. This is the call for us to come together and collaborate. Something else that came out of the visioning yesterday was this idea that if all of the churches, regardless of their religious identification, regardless of their theological practices and beliefs, if all of us came together in collaboration and prayed for peace, which is a part of each one of the agendas of our different denominations, however we divide them up, there is an underlying element of love and peace when you filter through all of the other stuff. If we all could come together and collaborate and pray for peace, peace would happen immediately within our world. And the song says, let peace begin with me. And so in the words of Barack Obama, Fear, uncertainty, and discomfort are our compasses toward growth. If you run, you stand the chance of losing. But if you don't run, you've already lost. So again, going back to this idea of the arc, if we stand still, we've lost. If we don't run, we've lost. And our job is to love one another and to embrace the infinite possibilities of coming together in collaboration and in cooperation. As we embrace discomfort, we find ourselves equipped with the tools to navigate life's twists and turns and gracefully and with grace and confidence. Are you willing to embrace the discomfort and unlock your full potential? The choice is yours. And going back to the beginning of this talk, the wisdom of Connie reminds us we're all one in the heart and mind of God. I invite us now to say together our affirmation for the week. I refuse to let fear make my decisions for me. Let us say that again. I refuse to let fear make my decisions for me. Let us pray together. Using the backdrop of knowing that we're all one in the heart and mind of God. I offer these words from Marianne Williamson. And this was the morning meditation for yesterday, February the 24th. And it says, continue with the music. I need not prove anything to anyone. I am blessed as a child of God. 
I needn't compensate for any lack in myself. For there is no lack in a child of God. I am a whole and complete spiritual being. I need do nothing to augment what is already perfect. In any moment, when I puff myself up, I appear less radiant. In any moment, when I am defenseless and humble, I am radiant with God's love and power. Today, I will be defenseless and safe in the arms of God. Dear God, please remove any armor in front of my heart and all barriers to my love. Take away my insecurities and remind me of my intrinsic value. Let me not be tempted to inflate who I am, which only diminishes my power and decreases my joy. And so just as I add my own voice to these powerful, this powerful prayer by Marianne Williamson, what I know to be true is that we are all one in the mind and the heart and mind of God. And so as I speak this word of blessing this morning, I bless the unity and I bless the cooperation I bless the collaboration that is taking place right here and right now in my own heart, in my own mind, and in the hearts and minds of those who are choosing to stand for something and to not be against anything. We recognize this all-prevailing spirit as always a presence and never an absence that is moving through and expressing itself in our individual lives. And so giving great thanks for this and so much more, I release this word into that law, which always says yes. And I just allow this to be. And I invite you to affirm this with me if anything resonates with you by saying, and so it is, and so it is. It is now time for us to share in the abundant circulation and the flow of God's love that is demonstrating through us. Thank you in advance for the wonderful way that you continue to support our spiritual community. And we have an affirmation of abundance that I invite us to say together. I recognize the presence of God Out of my abundance, consciousness flows everything I could desire in life. With gratitude and thanksgiving, I now participate in the flow of uninterrupted abundance. This prosperous experience is evidence of my abundance consciousness. And so for those of you who are here in the center, uh, you may leave your donations in our donation box that is on the hospitality table in the center. For those of you who are viewing online, you may donate by mail. Our address is on the screen. You may text to give, that information is on our screen. And you may also donate online, bottereycsl.org. And so I just have a few um, updates for, uh, to share with our, with our um, Facebook and YouTube viewers. Uh, the first one is the season for nonviolence, a reminder that we are still doing this in the season. And on our website and in our newsletter is the link to the 64 days and 64 ways practices where you can go in and follow the practice for the day on your own. So we invite you to take advantage of that. And also to let our virtual community know that the Infinite Possibilities class, the new dates are March 12th, March 19th, and March 26th. We delayed it uh, for a couple of weeks um, to get some things in order. Uh, the class will be offered on Zoom only, and to register for the class, um, send an email. My email is, is my email contact information is in our newsletter and on our website. 
And so as we say good morning to our Facebook and YouTube families, thank you for joining us this morning. And we invite you to return next week where we begin our new series for March. That's how we've never done it. That's how we've never done it. As opposed to that's how we've always done it. And our topic will be, it's a brand new day, baby. <laughs> so we invite you to uh, join us next week. And uh, we invite you to also like, comment, and share, and follow us on Facebook and YouTube. So good morning to our YouTube family.